Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. You've probably heard of the name Mary Celeste, but do you actually know the full story behind this so-called ghost ship? Because I didn't, but now I do, and I'm going to share it with you. This is as classic a mystery as you can get. And this video is kindly sponsored by Skillshare. As somebody who absolutely loves learning and education, I think Skillshare is one of the best things on the internet. It's an online learning community with so many different lessons to explore. There's something for everyone, no matter what you're interested in learning or creating, and it empowers you to achieve all of your goals. I was super, super excited to find out that one of my all time favorite photographers on Instagram has his own course on Skillshare. It's Instagram worthy photography, shoot, edit and share with Brandon Wolfall. His photography is absolutely beautiful. It's just so ethereal, so dreamlike. I've followed him for years and years. I just think he's amazing. But it's no secret that for somebody whose job revolves around social media, I am terrible at Instagram. I cannot take a good photo and I was so excited to learn some tips and tricks from my favourite photographer. He covers everything in this course from how to plan, how to find the right equipment and settings, editing, even retouching in Photoshop. And I'm so excited to put what I've learned from his course into action. My Instagram is going to be looking fab. Skillshare offers classes designed for real life so you can learn around your schedule and it's also incredibly affordable especially when compared to in-person classes and workshops. Skillshare is actually giving away two free months of premium membership to the first 500 people who click the link in the description box down below to help you explore your creativity. After that, it's only around $10 a month, which really is a great deal. I highly recommend Skillshare if you want to learn something new. It was December 4th, 1873, when the Mary Celeste was discovered sailing near the Azores Island. The ship was unharmed and all of her cargo was intact. It seemed to be in very good working order, apart from just one thing. The entire crew was gone. What happened to the crew of the Mary Celeste remains one of the greatest mysteries of all time. And as always with any historical mystery, there's a lot of inaccuracies that just come along with the passage of time. So this video is going to be A, to tell you the story of the Mary Celeste, and B, to maybe debunk some of these inaccuracies that come along with this story. We'll start this story just a few years beforehand though, with the building of the Mary Celeste in late 1860, on the shores of the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia, built by a man called Joshua Dewis. Now I was going to put in some details here about how the ship was built and the style of ship but honestly I don't have a clue about ships and I'm sure the majority of you don't either so it just seemed unnecessary to this story. She was a ship, she did her job, she floated. She was 30.3 metres in length, 7.8 metres wide and 3.6 metres deep and she was launched on May 18th 1861 under the name Amazon. It seems like this was a ship doomed from the very beginning. She encountered a number of mishaps over the coming years. I don't really know what the standard amount of bad things are that can happen to a ship until it's classed as unlucky, but this ship's journey was definitely not smooth sailing, excuse the pun. The ship was owned by a group of local people, including the builder Joshua Jewis, and the ship's first captain, Robert McClellan, who took the Amazon on her maiden voyage in June 1981. They sailed to five islands in Nova Scotia to pick up timber, which was then to be taken across the Atlantic to London. McClellan manages to get to the five islands to get the timber, before he falls ill, likely with pneumonia. So he manages to get the ship back across to Spencer's Island before dying on June 19th. But undeterred, John Nutting Parker takes over as captain and the voyage to London resumes. And of course, that trip wasn't smooth sailing either. The ship collided with fishing equipment in Maine, but managed to get to London safely to drop off the cargo. But on the return, she ran into a brig in the English Channel and sank it. Over the next couple of years, the Amazon worked mainly in the West Indies trade, sailing around the Caribbean, occasionally making trips across the Atlantic. Parker remained captain during this time, and it doesn't seem that they really had any more mishaps here. In 1867, William Thompson took over as captain, and things continued as usual until October 1867. 
there was a huge storm whilst the Amazon was sailing near Cape Breton Island, which is part of Nova Scotia, and the ship was driven ashore to Cal Bay and was so badly damaged that nothing could be done to save her. She was abandoned there as a wreck. But no worries, because that was not to be the end of the Amazon. She is then acquired by a local man called Alexander McBean, who then sells a wreck on somebody who sells it on again. A year after the shipwreck, the Amazon is now in the hands of a man called Richard W. Haynes, an American mariner from New York. He spent the money to restore the ship and named himself as her captain and changed her name to the Mary Celeste. You may actually have heard before the ship being called the Marie Celeste. Um, it seems there was a short story written years after the events, um, which basically was a fictional retelling of the story. In this short story, the name was altered to the Marie Celeste, which led people to think for many years that this was actually the true name of the ship. But she was actually formally registered under the name Mary, Mary Celeste. Richard Haynes went through all of this effort of restoring the ship though, only to have it seized by his creditors just one year later in 1869. Over the next few years, it seems like the ship may have changed hands a few times, and we don't really know of her trading activities in this time. But in early 1872, it seems that it was decided that the Mary Celeste was due an upgrade. She undergoes a major refit that cost $10,000, which was a hell of a lot more money in the 1800s than it is now. And the ship was made all round just a little bit bigger, and a second deck was added. She got a new captain as well, Benjamin Spooner Briggs. Basically, the ship at this point was owned by a group of people, all of whom wanted to be involved in the ship business, the maritime world, but wouldn't have necessarily been able to afford to do so on their own. So there was a consortium, a group of people came together to buy the ship. The consortium that owned the Mary Celeste at this point consisted of a man called James H. Winchester, who owned 6 twelfths, half of it, two minor investors who each held 1 twelfth, and Briggs, the captain, who held the remaining 4 twelfths. He had invested his life savings into this ship, so it was kind of in his best interest as owner and captain to look after it well and make good decisions. Benjamin Briggs was from Massachusetts. He was the son of a sea captain himself and he was one of five boys, all of whom, apart from one, ended up going to work at sea. It was in his blood to become a captain himself. He married his cousin, Sarah Cobb, and they had two children together, Arthur and Matilda. Briggs was a well-known captain of high standing in the field and he was known to be very good at what he did. He had considered retiring at one point but the call of the sea was too great and it was at this point that he decided to invest in the Mary Celeste. It was October 1872 when he took the ship for her first voyage following her refit. They were to go to Genoa in Italy with a cargo of 1,701 barrels of denatured alcohol. They were to set sail on 7th of November 1872 with seven members of crew on board, Briggs, his wife and their two-year-old daughter. Briggs had been incredibly careful with the choosing of his crew, knowing that he needed the best of the best for a journey on which he was taking his beloved wife and daughter, whilst his son stayed with family members in America to continue his schooling. He chose Albert G. Richardson, a man he respected and had sailed with before, Andrew Gilling, Edward William Head, and four German men, Volker Lorenzen, Bos Lorenzen, Arian Martins, and Gottlieb Gutschall. Everyone was in agreement here that this was a great crew, trustworthy, good at their jobs, and no one had any worries whatsoever when the ship set sail on the morning of the 7th of November. And of course, in 1872, once a ship set sail, that was kind of it. There was no way of communication until a ship eventually reached its destination, or perhaps another ship saw it in passing. If something was to go wrong, there was no way really of getting out a distress signal or calling for help. You were all on your own at sea. Eight days after the departure of the Mary Celeste, a ship called Digratia departed from America on a very similar route, also headed for Genoa, Italy, but they intended to go via Gibraltar instead. For the majority of the journey across the Atlantic, they followed the same route that the Mary Celeste had done just eight days earlier. And so, of course, when Captain David Morehouse spots the Mary Celeste floating in the mid-Atlantic, he knows that something's wrong. He knew that these ships never should have crossed paths on this journey. 
Now there are a lot of reports that Morehouse actually knew Captain Briggs personally, which is very likely seeing as they were both sea captains and it's highly likely they would have crossed paths on multiple occasions. But whether they were actually close friends or not is questionable. Morehouse's widow would say years later that they were close friends who dined together regularly, but this seems to be the only account of that. But it does make sense they would have known each other at least. It was the 5th of December, almost a month after the departure of the Mary Celeste from New York, and they'd reached a position of about 400 miles east of the Azor Islands, which is a collection of islands off the west coast of Portugal. I'm really sorry I might be pronouncing that wrong, I'm not sure if it's Azor or Azor or Azores. My internet's actually down in my house because of the big storm, which is very apt for this video and I can't check, so I'm really sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. The ship was floating almost directly between the Azores and mainland Portugal, and knowing that something was wrong, Morehouse changes course to head towards the Mary Celeste, and he launches a boarding party to check that everything was okay with the crew and passengers on board. He sends a couple of crew members on a small boat out to investigate, who called out to the ship many times, only to receive no reply to their signals. No one could be seen on deck, so they climb aboard, and no one was there. And there were clear signs that the ship had run into a little bit of trouble. The sails were partly set, although in poor shape, and some sails were missing entirely. There was just over a metre of water in the hold, which is a decent amount, but not really alarming. No good captain would have decided to abandon a ship over just a few feet of water in the hold. But yet, the ship's lifeboat was missing, showing that they had clearly, maybe, abandoned ship. Adding to the mystery comes the fact that all personal belongings had been left behind and the ship was well stocked with enough food and water to last six months. The crewman's gear was also still in their quarters, untouched. The kitchen was in a bit of a state, utensils and cutlery had been thrown around the room and the captain's room was wet and soggy. The bed was actually too wet to sleep in. The cargo, 1,701 barrels of denatured alcohol, seemed to be untouched, undamaged. And although most personal belongings had been left behind, it was noted that the captain's equipment, a chronometer, sextant, navigation book and the ship's register were all missing. The logbook did remain though, the final entry given the ship's position as six miles northeast of Santa Maria, the easternmost island of the Azores. This was written at 8am on November 25th, 10 days before the ship was discovered. It makes sense to assume that whatever tragedy happened, happened soon after this last entry in the logbook, although we'll never know that for certain. It could just be that the captain failed to fill in the logbook for a couple of days, although that does seem unlikely. There is also evidence to potentially suggest that Briggs's chronometer was inaccurate, and that the ship was actually 120 miles west of where he thought he was when he put the last entry into the logbook. Everyone was quite confused about what had happened aboard the ship. There was no evidence that had been involved in a collision or that any bad weather had damaged it particularly badly. As I said, there was about a metre of water in the hold, but this wouldn't have been enough for Briggs to decide to just abandon ship. There was a sword found under the bed in Briggs' cabin that did raise some questions. It was covered in a discoloration that many people thought originally to be blood, making people question whether there had been some kind of fight on board. But it was later proven to just be an odd coloured rust caused by the fact it had been cleaned with lemon, resulting in iron citrate forming on the blade there was no blood. Now, if you remember the video I did on the mystery of the Flannan Isles Lighthouse a couple of months ago, the next part of this story might ring a little bit familiar to you. You see, for a few years after the Mary Celeste was discovered floating abandoned, people didn't really care about it. Shipwrecks, death at sea, it happened all the time during the 1800s, and it wasn't always considered to be big news. It wasn't really until 1884 that the mystery of the Mary Celeste really came to be as big as it is today. This is over 10 years after it was found abandoned. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was a ship surgeon at the time, the person responsible for the health of a ship's crew during a voyage, and he was an aspiring writer as well. His two biggest interests combined in the story of the Mary Celeste. One of his earliest stories was the short story J. Habakkuk Jefferson's Statement, which was a fictionalised story of what happened aboard the Mary Celeste's fateful journey, written in the form of a first-person testimony by a survivor. It was first published anonymously in the January 1884 issue of Cornhill magazine. 
Over the coming years, it would be reprinted multiple times, and over time, people began to believe this fictionalised version of events to be the true story. Doyle wrote of steaming mugs of tea and half-eaten food left on the table, implying that the ship had not long been abandoned. The story said that everything about the ship was also in pristine condition, which we also know not to be true. And it was this account in which the name is written as the Marie Celeste instead of Mary Celeste. Sir Arthur Doyle only ever intended this to be a story, and he would openly say that he had taken a lot of artistic licence, but this didn't stop people taking it as gospel. And a lot of what we think we know about the Mary Celeste today still comes from this story. Also, quick fun fact, Doyle was actually the creator of Sherlock Holmes and Dr Watson. He helped mould the genre of crime fiction into what it is today. Under maritime law, the person that discovers a derelict vessel and salvages it could expect a share of the value of the ship and cargo. So it was only natural for Captain Morehouse to make the decision to use a skeleton crew from the De Gratia to sail the Mary Celeste to Gibraltar, 800 miles away, which is where they docked on the 12th and 13th of December, respectively. With a depleted crew on each boat, the last leg of this journey took much longer than it usually would have done, even though the weather at this point was relatively calm. Upon arrival at the harbour, the Mary Celeste was immediately impounded by the Vice Admiralty Court to prepare for salvage hearings, which was the standard process when a ship was salvaged at sea. On December 18th, the court met to consider whether Captain Morehouse should receive the salvage award. I mean, the obvious implication of him bringing the ship back was that he and his crew may have attacked the ship themselves, overthrowing Briggs and his crew for the sole purpose of claiming this reward money. I'm sure it was something that had been done by other crews in the past, so there always had to be a court decision on these kinds of matters. But seeing as there was no evidence of this happening in this case, in March 1873, Morehouse and the rest of the Digratia crew are hailed for their heroic efforts in bringing the ship back to shore and for their masterful seafaring. I mean, each ship had to complete their journey with bare bones crew and they were awarded £1,700 for their efforts, which actually wasn't that much. The Mary Celeste itself had been released from hold a month earlier, allowed to proceed to Genoa and finish her journey. But she had been fully examined in the aftermath, and it's the examiners who found this potential blood on this sword that turned out not to be blood, and they found the damage to the sails, and they found cuts on each side of the bow, and they found stains on one of the ship's rails that may have been blood, along with a deep mark in the wood that they said was caused by an axe. The original report suggests that this wasn't a natural disaster. It said that whatever happened on the ship had been down to human wrongdoing. Which brings us to the theories here. The human theory goes that there was some kind of mutiny on board, that the crew had broken into the alcohol below deck. Although the majority of the barrels had been found intact, there were a few which seemed to be damaged. Nine out of 1,701 barrels were empty. It was theorised that the crew got drunk and murdered the Briggses with the apparent bloodstained sword before throwing their bodies overboard. The crew then escaped in this small boat, leaving the ship unmanned. For some reason, the acting attorney for the Crown seemed really convinced that this was a case of mutiny and murder, but eventually the theory is dismissed. Briggs knew that he was bringing his family along on this trip, so he would have been really careful with who he chose his crew, choosing only men that he knew to be of upright character, and men he'd worked with previously. And his previous crews always reported him to be firm, but fair. He wasn't someone who was particularly hated as a captain. And you've also got to question, what on earth would the crew have gained from murder here? There isn't really any pro I can think of for this. Anyway, once the blood stains on the swords were proved to be rust and the deep marks in the wood were proved to be caused by weather instead of an axe, this theory was pretty much dismissed. Also, the cargo was denatured alcohol. It wasn't alcohol for human consumption. It's ethanol and it's used in solvents and as fuel. It's pretty poisonous if it's swallowed, so it's highly unlikely that the crew would have gone down there and tried to drink it. There's also the theory of foul play here, that perhaps the ship got overtaken by pirates. But we can probably all agree that this is rather unlikely, seeing as pretty much everything was left on board. All the personal belongings, all the barrels of alcohol, a group of pirates would not have gone on board, murdered everyone just for the fun of it, and then left everything on board untouched. Plus, it wouldn't explain the general state of the boat and the metre of water in the hold. 
and there have been no incidents of piracy recorded in this area for at least a decade. So considering this and the Dograti crew being ruled as innocent and awarded the salvage money, any kind of foul play was pretty much ruled out. And there's also the obvious crazy theories like a giant octopus or squid or a general sea monster murdering everyone on board the ship. I mean, I suppose it would make sense why all the cargo and personal belongings were left intact, but we can probably all agree that it's rather unlikely that it was a giant sea monster that got them all. Probably. Which leaves us with the two theories that are generally agreed to be the most likely in this case. Some kind of weather caused natural disaster, or an explosion caused by the cargo of alcohol. James Winchester, the man who owned the majority of the Mary Celeste, agreed himself that the latter was the most likely. The nine barrels that were found to be empty were actually different from the rest, in that they were made of red oak and not white oak. Red oak is known to be more porous, which may have led to the alcohol leaking out and creating an alcohol vapour in the hold. The barrels are all tied together with steel bands, which then have been rubbing against each other in the tumultuous weather at sea. It's well noted that this was a very stormy journey, the seas were not calm. Sparks may have began to fly, maybe even a small fire. I'm sure the fumes from this would have been absolutely potent. In a moment of panic, seeing as this is probably a situation which Briggs had never found himself before, he orders everyone onto the lifeboat. Maybe they tried to tie the boat to the ship so they wouldn't float too far away, but the weather was pretty bad. A strong wind would have been all it would take to push them away, floating into the sea. The last entry in the logbook shows that Briggs believed them to be six miles away from the Santa Maria Island, meaning that it should have been in full view of them at the time. Six miles isn't that far. Or maybe not because of the really bad weather conditions, it was stormy. Even if Briggs couldn't see the island, he probably thought it was there. So he thinks that he could sail the six miles to the island in this small boat. Only as we now know, it's likely that his chronometer was 40 and they were in fact over 100 miles away. At sea, they would have succumbed to the weather or died of hunger. The boat and the bodies never washing up or maybe they did wash up somewhere. This was the 1800s, and communication and news was nothing as it is today, of course. The biggest caveat to this theory, though, is that there were no burn marks anywhere in the hold. It's all based off the fact that these barrels were empty, but who's to say there wasn't a mistake made in New York and they were loaded onto the ship empty? And then, of course, there's the very obvious theory that the ship may have got caught in a bad storm, which could account for all of the water in the hold. But as we know, Briggs was a very experienced captain and a bit of bad weather and flooding would probably not have caused him to abandon ship. He would have had to have known for sure that the ship was going to sink. Which is where the ship's pumps come in. One of the two pumps on board was found to be completely disassembled, which tells us that it was probably broken. It seems that somebody had tried to fix it, but with only one pump working and the stormy weather, it can be kind of assumed that Briggs thought that it was only going to get worse from this point onwards. They're in a bad storm, water is flooding into the hold, and you've only got one pump that's working. You're going to panic a little bit. And this theory is supported by a sounding rod that was discovered on deck, a piece of equipment used to determine the amount of water in the hold without actually having to go down there and explore. This suggests that it was likely used shortly before the ship was abandoned, it was just lying there on the deck. With the captain thinking they were only a matter of miles away from land and water coming into the hold with only one working pump, he may have thought that it was safer to get everyone off the ship and head straight towards the island. With his wife and two-year-old daughter on board, he may have erred more on the side of caution than he usually would do. Maybe it was just a stroke of luck that perhaps the storm stopped and the Mary Celeste managed to stay afloat. It was clearly still in a pretty decent condition though with the Dagratia crew managing to get it to Gibraltar with only four members. Despite many searches, no trace of the Mary Celeste crew or lifeboat has ever been found. After this tragedy, everything seems to go downhill for the Mary Celeste. She's a pretty unlucky ship at this point. She trades hands many times over the next few years, eventually being acquired by Captain G.C. Parker. In 1885, he deliberately sailed the ship into a reef near Haiti as part of an insurance fraud plan, but surprisingly, she still failed to sink. This is an unsinkable ship. She was found, G.C. Parker's plan was unveiled, and he was arrested. 
But by this point, the Mary Celeste is beyond repair and she's left on the reef where she deteriorates over the years. Many people over the years have attempted to find the ruins and in 2001, a marine archaeologist announced he may have found the remains of a ship embedded in a reef near Haiti. But now it seems that this wood that he found may have actually been growing as late as 1894, which was 10 years after the Mary Celeste demise. So it probably isn't her remains. And that's the mystery of the Mary Celeste. It's clear that some kind of disaster happened and the crew had to abandon ship. I don't think it was a giant sea monster, but we'll never know for sure. I think they were caught in a bad storm, the water was coming into the hold, the pump wasn't working, and Captain Briggs thought they were only six miles away from the nearest island. So he just thinks, to be safe, he's gonna get everyone in the boat and they'll go to the closest island, which should have only been six miles away. He didn't realize that he was out in his calculations by over a hundred miles they surely just perished at sea. But as always, let me know what you think about this in the comments. Make sure you check out Skillshare in the top line of the description box to learn some new things. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.